Bibles, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. I'll be down in a minute, Cheryl. Give me a few minutes to get there. You know, what happens in our relationship with our fathers greatly touches every aspect of our lives. Until I became a student of the Scripture, I did not realize just really how important dads were and fathers were and mentors were. And by the way, just because you can biologically doesn't mean that you're always a, a father or a dad. Uh, again, none of my children are, are biological to me, yet... Uh, I appreciate the privilege to get to be their dads. So all of us long, all of us long to be accepted by others. We may say we don't need it. We may get that Lone Ranger syndrome, rebel attitude. We may even learn to make it without it. Still, yet all of us need it. A father's approval, affection, and affirmation all have such a tremendous effect on our lives. When I graduated from high school, barely. Uh, my, uh, my dad really wanted me to go into some type of, uh, he called it a sit-down job. He said, son, you need a sit-down job because he knew I was struggling with the muscular dystrophy and, and had uh, been on crutches so much with uh, having operations on my foot. So he, uh, I went to college for a few months, and I tried it. it uh, I wasn't saved, and so I was acting out and partying and driving a fast car, working, going to school. Realized I couldn't do all that. So I remember I, I wrote my dad a letter, and the letter said, Dad, I, I can't keep living this life that I'm living and going to college, so i got to quit something, so I want to quit college. And uh, when I graduated from college with a bachelor's degree, he gave me the letter back to remind me that, you know, you may have one thought, at 18, 19 years of age, but God directs your path. Then he struggled with me becoming a pastor and evangelist and things of that nature. And uh, he said, how are you going to make it doing that? He said, because he didn't understand the church world at all. And I was just figuring it out. And I said, Dad, I, I feel like I could do this thing, you know. See, folks seem to like to hear me talk about y'all. And then, and then things started escalating. It wasn't until he came to Texas to see all the things that, that we had been involved in here that he, his eyes began to open. Of course, you know, later my dad gave his life to Christ, and I baptized my dad. And now uh, for over a year and a half, he's been gone. Well, this, I'm going through a, a, I'm having one of those moments this week where I, I, I went, my stuff is everywhere, as you know. After the flood, my, my stuff is scattered. I'm not in my home yet. We're not, Lori and I, and, uh, we're in a trailer house, but I keep moving up. I got to get out of that, that, ha that trailer house because David's enlarged his family. He's moving into that trailer house, so everything got to get to moving here, you know. But I went through this big box I had of letters from people like you, and we don't send out letters anymore. We send text messages. You notice that. But we used to write letters to people. We used to tell them what we thought, and you get that letter. Well, I had a big old stack of letters uh, uh, for the la from the last 15 years, and I started going through them, and, man, you know, they touched my heart. Some of them I had to put down. I found stuff, Jeanette, from you and Jimmy, you know, and Patsy and others. I went through H, you know, I just, just stuff I'd find, and it just uh, old pictures. Well, then I came across something I, I, I did not even remember that I'd gotten. It went like this. It was actually a private message sent. Uh, to the church, it said, Jerry Hovatter's father, so this was before my dad had a stroke, stopped by Shooting Irons Emporium. This would be over in uh, probably Florence or Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Today, while his mother was visiting the doctor's office and gave me the address to this uh, website, Mr. Hovatter is a very proud father of his son and grandchildren and their accomplishments. I enjoyed my visit to this site and liked the concept of making religion fun and exciting. It's always interesting to see that some Christians believe in a forgiving and merciful God instead of a vengeful one. It's good 
It's good to see those who understand God wants his followers to enjoy life and what he has made instead of fearing all it has, it has created. What hit me in this letter was my dad being proud of me, which he'd never come out and told me. He never said to me, but he'd go around and tell others how he felt about me. And when you read that, you say, now, come on, Pop. And you, you, I mean, I'd love to have heard it from, and I knew he was proud, but my dad was just, you know, military, uh, uh, depression, age. He didn't have a biological father that took care of him when he was coming up. And so when I read that, it really connected to me. You know, dads, you, you got a picture of my pop there? There he is. Got both dads there. Amen. But, as, you know, and what I like about this picture of my pop is, I remember when I got taller than him. I remember when I grew up hired him. And I smarted off to my mama. And my next scene was looking up from the ground. <laughs> Can I tell you? I didn't move till he walked away. I stayed on the ground. I, I realized it didn't matter that I got taller than that man. He could still put me in my place. And he's stretching that arm around me there. I, I, just, I just liked the fact that, that Pop was, was Pop. He was who he was. And, and Dad, to you too, sir. Thank you. And I could tell that, uh, well, you, you never got us, you and your daughter right there. I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Amen. Masculinity is bestowed. I mean, people, young people say, well, they just don't respect me. Respect is earned. Amen. Amen. It's earned. Uh, honor is bestowed. You bestow honor on a personality, and uh, not personalities, but positions of a father, mother, president, a doctors, whatever, a policeman, <laughs> places like that. You, you, you give them their honor. But on the flip side, you've got to earn respect as, as young men and women. But masculinity is bestowed. A boy learns who he is and what he's got from a man or the company of men. Throughout biblical history, it's the man that gives the son their name. Fathers affirm their sons and daughters. Even Jesus needed to hear these, those words of affirmation from the Father. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased, God said of his, uh, the Father said of his, of his boy. Are you comfortable? It, let me say something to make you maybe a little uncomfortable. Uh, maybe it's my biblical opinion, but I, I believe if we're going to see this generation shift, us men, fathers, mentors, uh, those that we are, we got to start getting these boys around us. We got to start pouring some things into them. But, you know, there's there's this age of femininity where where it's just you can't tell boy girl. And again, I'm, I'm going to state just my biblical opinion of this. I find that when men, young boys, get around men, they start acting more like men. And if you can do things to keep them around men, Amen. To encourage them, you know, when my grandson said, "Papa, let's go wet a hook," I'm going to wet a hook. We're going to fish. Amen. We're going to get out there. I'm going to rough him up. Judah comes in the house. Colton takes off running because he knows that Judah is touchy-feely. And that boy is going to grab hold of Colton and start beating him up. And he starts trying to run. He ain't got no mama to run to now. Mama ain't here. He's going to have to learn to fight. Amen. So I said, get in there and fight that boy, son. And he'll take a cheap shot at Judah and then take off running. Funny thing happened, you know, I went fishing with them guys, and I went out and bought me some rod and reels and had them in the back of the truck. And I got this one I really like called an ugly stick, and it had an old lure on it we've been catching them bass with. And threw it in the back of the truck. Man, we've just been having a great time fishing. Bring Colton back up to Wichita Falls last week, him and his sister Cassie. Get back down here, run my car through the car wash, get home. I had two rod and reels in the back of my truck. Got to thinking, where did that other rod and reel go? And then I remember I heard an odd sound, sound going through the car wash. Clink, clink, clink. That thing come through there and picked up that rod and reel, grabbed that treble hook, and I lost my rod. I know that's where that rod and reel is. I'm just really sure. But I'm afraid to go back. Because I got this funny feeling that that Lexus behind me might have got scratched up just a little bit. I'm just not real sure about all that just yet, all right? If that was you, again, my apology. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, God's not calling us men evil. 
Let me just break this down. This is in an English version of something coming out of the Greek. What, God, what the Scripture is actually saying here is, and listen to me good, Dad, some of you are fantastic dads. You've done some great things. Oh, you, you look after your children. You, you dress them. You feed them. You discipline them. You've given them boundaries. You've been so good to them. And you think you're the most wonderful thing compared to God, our Father. We're evil. The best we can do here on this earth. Is evil compared to him. That's what I want you to catch is just how great your God is. How wonderful a father he is. And if, you, if he, you give good gifts, you can give good gifts to your kids. Imagine what your heavenly father is going to do for every son and daughter in this house. Amen. I mean, I just want to tell let me escalate him in your eyes. Let me magnify him just a little bit. He has blessed us with grace and mercy, salvation, a kingdom waiting on us, healing, all the good things that God's going to do. He's going to pour it on us. So as good as I can be here on this earth, he's so much better. So he's not calling you evil, so don't tuck tail and run. Don't give up on what you're doing. Just understand that no matter how good you can make it here, he's that much better. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, now let me just share from my heart, Lord, these feelings that I have. Lord, lift up every father in this house. Lord, we've, we've all got hurts and needs. None of us, they know none of us perfect in what we've done. Oh, we've looked at others. We've compared our, our, our marriages and our, our, our parenting to others we've seen in books and life. It's demoralized us, Lord. It's put us down. We don't feel as, as, as good as Chip and Joanne or Joanna or whatever in Waco. But, God, we try and we're working at it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. What is that girl's name? Joanna. Love them. Love them. Love Chip. 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 I love Chip. I didn't know what Fixer Upper was until our house was destroyed. I had no idea what that show was going to cost me until my wife started watching it either. Man. But they're perfect, you know, in so many ways. And I just go, oh, man, I can't. You just, anyway, I'll, I'll quit. Yeah, and I know men fail at times being, father, uh, being husbands. I realize that. But dads, we can't fail at being dads. We've got to really work at being a good father. You know, we have a family problem, at least other problems. And in writing to the Corinthians, Paul compares his role as an apostle to the role filled by dads. Uh, he said, no one can take the unique place of dad. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, out of the message there, message Bible says, there are a lot of people around who can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong. But there aren't many fathers willing to take the time and effort to help you grow up. A lot of times folks point out what you're doing wrong, but show me how to do this. Give me an example. You know, uh, the, the, the I, well, how does that say? The, I'll, I'll think of it for the next service. Again, our, our biggest need in the world is dads. I really believe this. Who will give the gifts to their children of affirmation, approval, affection, to accompany their kids through life. And, and I believe there is such a thing as a father hunger. And because that hunger is not filled, it often leads to father wounds. What was lost in the garden was not only spiritual, it was literal. The father's heart is to bring healing and restoration to his children. I remember reading the story of the prodigal son. The scripture says the prodigal was far off. I think a lot of us have lived with that far off feeling that we've been a far away. We've been away from, from the father, not just physical father but our spiritual father and it's something that's got to draw us in the father establishes our identity who we are uh again these are things you learn as you grow up i'll start looking in the mirrors and i and i mean i'm like i'm looking back at my dad it's like i see him in me i i picture my dad doing things and saying things and and there are things about my father you know i whoo, my dad had a had an anger issue fit uh, uh he invented words that I know he believed were curse words. At least I did. Uh, you know, and so you see that, but you don't have to be that way. Amen. Amen. You, you can make that change now while you can. Child development and the suffering of rejection. You know, don't we all live lives in search of purpose and in search of significance? And many times being around a dad can help us discover that. And God, God, I told you how great he is. Let me tell you why God's so great. One thing is he covers us as a father. Psalm 46.1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. First off, let me say, all of us one time or another, we get in trouble. And God is our refuge. He's our place that we can go to. He's our strength. Psalm 91.3 says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. I, I, I have this... Uh, perception, this understanding of, of God the Father as one who will take care of. He, he, he'll snatch me away and cause me to escape. He, he'll cover me. He looks after me. He fences me in. He protects me. This is what a father does. He is a protector. You know, my dad taught me to lock the doors at home. He taught me how to shoot a gun. He taught me that if, if he's not around, I got to take care of the house as the oldest son. It was important for me to learn that as I was coming up. Dads are protectors. And, and our God covers us and looks after us. Dads, if we don't cover our children, who will? If, if we don't cover them, who will? Because there's always somebody poaching and trying to hurt them and teach them wrong. So there's got to be a covering. There's got to be a place. Yeah, there's discipline under that covering, but still I cover you. I love you. I, I mean, as long as I'm on this earth, I'm covering my kids. I'm looking after them. The Scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 9, you know, Dad, you got to make your gifts count. And you, we all got gifts we can give to our children and those that are, we're mentoring. It's just asking to be given to you. But, Pastor, I don't know how to be a good dad. Ask. Come on, ask. Ask. God, I don't know. Get in the book. How did he do it? Ask. I don't know how to be a good mama. Ask. Now, we already had Mother's Day, but this includes a lot of mamas in here because you've had to train up your kids yourself. You didn't have no help around you. You had to take care of both roles of mom and dad and then, then become grandparents. So, I mean, it's amazing what you've done. So, first, ask. Ask and be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, to him who knocks the door will be open. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I, I do look forward to the day to see what those good gifts God has applied for us. But I believe that asking for good gifts is also for here. Amen. And God gives us good gifts here. The gift of wisdom, love, peace, joy, those things here. A dad's gift of affirmation, acceptance. You know, accepting. Accepting your kids. It's such, there are times your kids will do stuff. I promise you, you'll turn your head and go, I ain't never, I don't know whose kid that is right there. I ain't, I, or you'll say something like this, honey, your kid screwed up again. I mean, you know, you're pawing that kid off at that moment. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the mother's kid at that moment. But, but it's important to accept them. You know, the Scripture, we'll, we'll read it later on, says, This is my beloved son. God loved his son while he was here. Knowing you are loved is a powerful thing. When you affirm them, to receive with favor, to take pleasure in them, well-pleasing. Uh, you don't always have to be spitting icicles and being mean toward your kids. There are times you've got to affirm them. You got now. I know there's that mushy side. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about telling him though. I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, and a, and a, an affirmation toward them. Catch them doing good. I know that can be hard sometimes. But if you just catch them doing good, just the littlest thing, and start affirming them in that, receive them with approval, a dad's gift of approval. So affirm them, and let that be a gift. Uh, it doesn't have to be monetary all the time, a gift of approval, approval for the right things. John 15, 10, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remain in his love. How do you remain in your parents' love? Obey them. If you want to stay in their love, Obey your parents. It's, it's not hard. I mean, isn't this simple? It is so simple. Sometimes I can't say, why why you treat me this way? Because you ain't listening. You ain't obeying. You know, I, I told this story before, but it bears repeating. For years, it seemed like for years, I to get my son, Josiah, take the trash out. That's all I want you to take the trash out. And he wouldn't take, you know, the trash would build up. And then I'd have to take it. So I got to the point where I said, one day I took the trash and, and, uh, and, and I, I tied it all up and I put it in the bathtub and I shut the shower curtain. So he goes in to take a bath and he walks in the living room and looks at me like. And he looks at me again. And I'm smiling at him. I go, what? You know, that's what they do to me. What? 
Why did you put the trash in the tub? What trash? <laughs> Why did you put the trash? I, I don't know. I guess, son, so you'll take it out before you take a shower, hopefully. And then you got the message. And sometimes you got to do stuff like that. You know, you got to help them understand what you're trying to say. Evidently, they're just not listening. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, a rat trap only hurts for a little while. And if you'll set that in their bed. Okay, let's get back here. As a dad, it's important to discern your kids. Watch this. I'm, I'm a temperament person. I look at temperaments. I try to discern people real quick. Introvert, extrovert. Sanguine, melancholy, choleric, phlegmatic. You pick up, everybody has a temperament. Every, and a lot of those are blended. Jesus, all four blended into his life. You see him at times being sanguine, going real, real out there, and other times you see him melancholy on the mountain. So I'm not trying to stereotype. I'm just saying that's how I pick up on people. I'm not a prophet. I just know a little bit about people. So I, I pick up on them. You've got to discern your kids, your, their will and spirit. There's a difference in will and spirit. When, you, when you're around your kids, that spirit is their attitude, their sparkle, their life, lively courage, daring, and animated. You do not want to crush that in the life of a child. You want them out there. You want them to be who they are. You want their, their spirit to just come alive. It's their will that you've got to break. It's the will that God broke in our life. It was the Father's will that Jesus, the Son, did everything he could to try to please the Father. Not my will, but thine be done. If as children, teenagers, and you right now as adult kids, if you want to understand a little bit something about parenting, understand the difference in the spirit and the will, that your will has to break at times. There's times that, that, that I had to bend my, not just bend, but break my will in order to please my father and mother. There are times that we have to do that also in our, in our own life. Jesus said, the scripture said, he went a little further, fell on his face and prayed, Father, not my will. If it's possible, let this cup pass. That's what I'd like to have. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, Dad, what is it that you want? If you want to please your earthly parents, if you want to please your, your heavenly Father, that's the simple question. But, you know, what do you want? My boys asked me last night, Dad, what do you want? You know what I'm going to say. Be in church. No, give me something else. Huh? Evidently, that was the case even today uh, with here. My boys are going to be there when I get there. But I'm just saying, many times our kids ain't going to give in on that one. But that's what I want. I just want, like Sam, I just want my kids in church, man. That's all. Sitting with me, worshiping with me, hugging me, kissing me, all those things. That's the good stuff. Now, but what do you want? And finally, I thought, you know what? First off, I had to think about it. How much money do they have? If they ask me at the right time of their life when they got big bucks, they're going to get a different answer. I mean, Judas threw it at me. He said, Dad, what do you really want? I said, I want a 6'4 engine in my Challenger. <laughs> Dad, I can't do that. I know. Because <laughs> you work at Vans selling shoes. So you can't do that for me right now. So what do you, what do you really want? They asked me last night, and I said, I want a razor. And Judah lit up. He said, those yellow ones? I said, no, I have those. I got the 99-cent razor. I want the one above that with two blades that really work good. I don't, need a, I don't need a trimmer. I got a trimmer. I need a razor. And both boys lit up like, we can do that. <laughs> yeah, give me, give me something we can do for you. And there's times I think God puts stuff on us. He says, uh, here's, what do you want me to do? God knows what you can do, what you can't do. You know, when you're a new believer, just getting a razor might be a good thing. Just starting out a little bit with God. Just pressing in a little prayer, a little reading, stuff like that. But it comes time in your life when you've been serving him long enough. Yeah, Lord, whatever it is you want, I'll give you. I'll do whatever I can to please you. Amen. This is important. Approval is a part of the guidance system. Jesus said, I do only those things that please him. In John chapter 8, verse 28. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man then you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone. 
for I always do what pleases him. You know, there's something about understanding that Jesus had this perception is that the Father was always with him. That wherever he went, the Father was following him. That if he moved through the mountains, the Father was with him. Over the water, the Father was with him. And, and I know many of us, our fathers have gone on. And I got to still think that my father's attitude or, or, you know, not that he's watching me all the time. But there's still a sense of knowing he's with me. He's, a, he, he's, he's still a part of him. Is still inside. I'm, I'm genetically, I'm, I'm a lot like him, but, but just a lot of my dad. But my heavenly father's always watching me. I don't always have to have him around, but he's guiding me. He leads me and guides me. What the scripture teaches me. And our kids today need guidance. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one walk with me than merely point the way. The eyes are better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is often confusing, but example is always clear. They watch us by example. They observe. That was what I was trying to remember a while ago. Okay. Thank you, Lord. I'm not gone yet. You know, approval is a powerful thing. Disapproval. Boy, those eyes. The eyes of disapproval from a parent can burn you, man. There are times my dad never said anything to me. He just looked at me. And I knew my was in trouble. Young boy, five, six years old, riding in the back of a 49-4. My dad had rules. When we hit that pavement, you sat down. You sat down in the truck. Me and my cousins in the back of that truck. I remember I got up trying to show off. I walked to the tailgate of that truck while the truck was moving. And I turned around to come back toward the cousins. When I did... I saw the rearview mirror. <laughs> at that moment, those eyes looked at me and went. And when his eyes went down, I went down. <laughs> and I sat there in silence, knowing that when I got home, we were going to go back past the musky dime vines, <laughs> out past the two-holer bathroom. And my dad was going to teach me a little lesson about standing in a moving truck he, he you ever ran in place he'd grab that hand he'd swing and he had to try to miss that belt my dad could tweak my arm hold me down boy and just wear me out and he did I'll never forget there's certain whoopings in life you just don't forget because it came with a lesson and I don't to this day I ain't standing in the back of a truck where there's sitting moving or sitting still it's in my eyes of disapproval. I can't, I can't tell you. Well, let me start closing up here with a few thoughts. A dad's gift of affection. Covered, covered by love. Affection as the Father has loved me. When rejection is experienced, it produces the feelings of inadequacy. You don't measure up. God commended his love for us that while we were yet still sinners, he loved us. Kids need two things from all of us dads and moms. Touch and verbal affirmation. Touch, we never outgrow. We never outgrow touch. We're still looking for touch. We made a touch. God gave us touchers. Feelers. Hug. I mean, it's, uh, and I'm talking about being appropriate with it. But it's important to embrace, to reach out, to touch, to punch, to whatever it takes. Amen. For that kid to know how much you love them. And, and verbally affirm them. Uh, you know, continual criticism destroys the intimacy of the home. When you continually, sir, if you continually criticize mom, if you continually criticize the children, you're destroying all the intimacy, all the good things that a home is supposed to be. You know, they need to hear, I love you, you're beautiful, I believe in you. Yeah, that expression is so important to be able to express yourselves and your feelings. Now, listen, kids need to express themselves. They need to be able to tell you what they're thinking. Because they're going to tell somebody. So they need to tell. Now, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I open up communication with my kids. Tell me what you're really thinking. Tell me how you feel. Now, I'm not talking about manifesting. Y'all understand manifest? When they, when they look like they got a devil in them. They come out slamming doors, beating up stuff. Well, he's just expressing himself. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. you got to cast the child out of that devil. That devil needs some relief. <laughs> them devils, boy, they get tired of dealing with them kids, I promise you. So you got to cast a child out of the devil at that moment. But I'm telling you, I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. Because if a child keeps manifesting like that, they get into anger. And listen to me, catch this well. Anger always assassinates authority. 
When you get angry and you don't deal with your anger properly, whether you be an employee, an employer, a mom, dad, child, teenager, if you don't deal with your anger, you're going to start assassinating the authority. Back when Obama was president, every uh, uh, conservative that hated him were angry about it. All they thought about it, they assassinated him with their words. Now that Trump's president, all the liberals that hate him, assassinating him. Because why? We, it's after authority. When you get mad at your boss or your employer, you get upset, you don't deal with that anger, anger always assassinates authority. It always goes after authority. When a child gets mad and angry at a parent, even though that parent gave birth, that parent has mentored, that parent has poured into them, they get upset with them, and all of a sudden they start, when I say assassinate, I don't mean literally shoot them. I'm just talking about they think of ways to undermine them, hurt them, uh, malign them, take them down. Therefore, you've got to control your anger in life. If I don't catch, if you don't catch anything else I say today, catch that. That anger always assassinates authority. You get mad at me, you're going to find a way to, because it's always about authority. What's over you? I'm going, then I'm going to go after you. Amen. I'm going to find a way to, to, to take you down so you get angry. So be careful with that. So as you move through life, allow the child to express. But that manifestation, you can't allow that. A dad's gift of accompaniment and validation. Matthew 3, and I'll start close. Right, this is a long closing. Okay. Uh, 3.16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. Th to me, this is so much more than just a, a Bible lesson. Oh, this, this shows me who the Father is. That moment, heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. As soon as Jesus, come on, next slide. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. There is atmosphere, stratosphere, heavenly fear. There's your three levels here. And God himself, from the portals of the, or the balcony of heaven, opened up a portal over the baptism of Jesus, took his hands and went down and opened up the heavens. And with his voice, made sure that son heard what he said. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He hadn't even started his ministry yet. He ain't healed no sick yet. He ain't turned no water to wine. He hasn't done any accolades. He's not hit a home run. He's not dunked a basketball. She ain't did the cheering. She ain't put her makeup on properly yet. And he looks down from heaven and says, my boy, my daughter, opens it up, looks down. I mean, made a spectacle of it. Sometimes that kid might get a little embarrassed, but you got to make a spectacle. You got to do something crazy. Right? I mean, I don't care if they're running water out on the ball field and yell, That's my boy! You're the best water boy in the world! That's some quality H2O, you hollering ass, huh? Just let it be known. That's my kid. There's something about that kind of parent that does that. Oh, it's embarrassing for a moment, but you'll never forget it. Unlike when you hit high school and you started making your parents drop you off down the road from the school because you was ashamed of that, uh, that station wagon they were driving. Mm -hmm. If the Son of God needed affirmation, how much more do we need it? If Jesus needed to hear, this is my son, how much more do we need that? The proper care of a dad for his kids. Dads, we meet three basic needs. We settle the question of being valued. We make sure that child knows they're important. We settle the question of being accepted, where they fit, helping them where they fit. Again, God bent your baby. How does that child go? Do they move toward athletics? Do they move toward dance? Do they move toward uh, uh, cosmetics? Do they move toward, you know, whatever, a salesman? Wherever they move toward, you start pushing them in that direction. He settles the question of having talent, ability. There are times you must be honest with your child and say, Son, you ain't never going to be able to join the NBA at five foot one. 
You got to be honest with them. You got, but but but, it doesn't mean you can't be the best chess player in the world. You know, you shift it for them. Help them understand that, because kids get these ideas. But you settle the issue of ability. My dad would, oh, he self-taught banjo picker. Then he give me a, bought me a guitar. Oh, he wanted me to play music with it. He loved that bluegrass music. Bluegrass music. She walked through the woods leading down to the river. Her hair shined like gold in the bright morning sun. She took all the love that her poor boy could give her and left him to die like a fox on the run, like a fox, like a fox on the run. Well, my dad wanted me to learn that bluegrass. He, he wanted me to play that guitar. And I remember I sat in there in that bedroom of mine and I took that guitar and I'd just strum it and strum it so he could hear it, that I was strumming it. But it already hurt my fingers. I didn't like it. I could do C, G, and D. And I'd strum it and strum it. And then I just had to say, Dad, he did, actually, he, he gave me the out. He said, son, you ain't never going to be a guitar picker. <laughs> I agreed with him and walked away from it. It was not my gift, ability, or talent. Amen. I knew what he wanted from me, but I, I couldn't produce that. Dad, you got to settle that issue. You know, we need fathers to practice instant forgiveness. Be careful. It's okay to cry with your kids, laugh with your kids, to use failures, opportunities to teach. Man, when that kid fails, teach. What did they learn from that? We need fathers who lose the anger without losing their passions in life. We need fathers to have a generous heart. You know, we can't change our past dads, but we can change our future. We can give good gifts. I'd like for all the dads in the house to stand. All you daddies, stand up. All you daddies, come up here. All you daddies, come up here. I need all the dads in here. Hey, all you dads. All the daddies. All you daddies. Come up here. It ain't bad. It ain't bad. I promise you it ain't bad. Y'all just spread out across here. Let me see all my dads in the house. Spread out, guys. I need all the dads up here in the front. All the way across here. There you go, dads. Come on up. Come on, daddy. Come on, daddy. Good looking bunch of daddies up here. Every daddy got a story. Um, David, reach in that pouch here, and you'll see a, a bank book. A bank, uh, a, some money. Give me that money. Thank you, sir. If there's one thing that I learned as a dad, that is to give my kids time. And it took a while because I worked uh, several jobs while starting a pastor at church. I ran a hotel. I, uh, I went around trying to sell, some of you don't even know this, tower, uh, water towers, paint jobs on water towers. Every time I could get one of those sold, I got money for it. Then I pastored the church. Mowed the grass. I did whatever I could. But I remember when a guy let me borrow a Harley once. My kids were on the back. And each one, each one of my children, as they come up, it wasn't about riding that Harley. It was time with Dad. Just getting time with Dad. Just a little time with you. And then you got your grandkids. You got time with your grandkids. Just some time with them. And then there are those kids that look at you as a father figure. If you could do something with them. Now, every Father's Day, as you remember, I've always had tools in here, haven't I? Where you can come up and get tools. Oh, I've given you pressure gauges, reminding you of the pressure of the being a father. I've given you bandanas to teach you to cover your children. Oh, I've given you tape measures to measure yourself up next to God, you know, and that we never measure up. I, you know, and so this year I said, Lord, what, what can I do? And I felt like God spoke to me and said, do what you've been doing, give. So I went to the bank and I took my check and I brought it in to the bank teller. And I said, man, I need you to cash my check. She said, all right. She said, what do you want? I said, I want you to give me all tens. And boy, they scrambled like mad. Tens? So why do you want all tens? I said, because I want to impart into each one of my fathers, the fathers of this house, a little bit of seed money. Now you can take them out for ice cream. You can use this money to buy a gift and send to them if they're away. You can use it as seed money to buy them a steak. Unless you can find a couple of really good $2 steaks. 
But it's all I got for you. But I want you to know in my heart, this would be a better church if I know that you're spending some time with a child or children and pouring your life into them. So start giving each other 10 bucks. Take one and send it around. I want the remainder. Go on, split that thing in half. Got another group over here. There you go. Sit up that way. Grab one. Don't, it's not yours, and it better not get back in that offering plate. All the way around. If everybody gets one. Tell me if you're on out. I, I, I split my check, so I got more because I got two churches. Keep it. David, get another pouch. I got, I got one more in there. I don't know if we're going to have enough. We have to get another check cashed on the way to. Did you run out over there? Still got some? Go, go, go. Come on. Why is it so slow? Get that money, man. Where y'all at over here? You got any left? Thank you, Lord. Who didn't get it? You got some left? Did everybody get one over there? Did they get some? Did y'all get y'all get mine? Got it? Got it? Got it? Hold it up. Let me see it. Make sure you got it. Don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. Oh. Everybody got one? All right. All right. Those lifted up, let's pray. Father, help us to take some time this week, next week or whenever we can, to send a gift, to take out a child. Lord, to bless a one of our own children, not all of them. God, I thank you. Lord, we, we have to invest in this next generation. we got to make our investment count. Lord, they're coming up with so many different skewed ideas. Get us back to the book. But let mercy and grace season our words in our life. I thank you for every father in this house. I pray your blessing fall on over them. God, that they realize what, it's not just the responsibility, but all the privilege hearing someone call me dad hearing someone say the words Paul Paul to knowing that I count and I matter in somebody's life Lord we want to make you proud we being evil do the best we can but we want to make you proud in Jesus name amen 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 God bless you guys Put that, fold that up and put it back there, that $100 bill you got in your bill phone that your wife don't know you have. Amen. Our servant leaders would come up. Dads, I'll say it again. Give the gift of affirmation, approval, affection, and love to your children. Amen. Now, if you need a tithe or offer an envelope, lift your hand. Our servant leaders are making their way to you.